Welcome all. I, I like to uh, start out my presentations on geoengineering with this cartoon, and I hope all of you have had a chance to read it. I think that it uh, provides a suitable motivation for why we're interested in geoengineering and um, indicates how difficult it can be to cut your, oneself off from addictions that you know are bad for you. In this case, the addiction is CO2 or fossil fuel burn, which as a byproduct produces CO2. And as a further motivation for this, uh, for geoengineering, I'll uh, show you this slide, which was published a few years ago in the Proceedings of the National Academy. And uh, what it shows you are a set of measured and projected emissions of CO2. The colored lines here are the projections that a group of economists put together based on technology assessments and uh, population growth, etc., on what one might anticipate CO2 emissions would be over this period of years. The black lines here with the open and closed circles are estimates of what we have indeed been burning uh, at this point. And in fact, if, one, if you look at the last few years, and we have more recent estimates as well, the CO2 emissions here are higher than any of the projected emissions that these economists put together. And uh, in spite of our recognition that CO2 is bad, there, the, the CO2 emissions are bad, there's really been, it's been very, very difficult to wean ourselves of this. And we've known for many years that it's going to take really a transformation of technology uh, for pr production of energy in order to reduce the amount of CO2 that we're using. And that we haven't seen a great deal of um, progress that's been made on it today. In addition to that, if you look at what's been happening with other model projections, I'm showing you here the percent change in sea ice uh, compared to a slew of models that participated in the 2007 IPCC estimates. You'll see the black line here are the observed sea ice distributions, and these other cloud of lines are the projections that uh, modelers put together of sea ice loss. And we'll, you'll see that the sea ice losses are indeed occurring even faster than our climate models are projecting. So um, this leads to, can lead one to a number of uh, conclusions. One is it's hard to wean oneself from CO2 emissions. Two, our models are still quite uncertain and not able to, to do a, a good job of predicting many climate features, and I'll come back to that point later on in the lecture. But three, that the changes that are occurring are occurring even more rapidly than in some cases than our models are capable of predicting. So this motivates the need to consider some mechanisms for, or has motivated some scientists to consider other mechanisms for staving off some of the effects of climate change. And one of those uh, techniques has come to be known as geoengineering. And I've provided you here with a one definition of geoengineering. The intentional change in the climate system introduced to counter some of the effects of increasing greenhouse gases. There are a variety of, of different effects that uh, can operate. And it, it's, it's come, um, there, were, there have been a variety of, of um, conversations that have been occurring about geoengineering for at least 30 years. I don't have time to, uh, to really go through that history with you, but uh, the acknowledgement of man's role on climate has uh, came, sort of came to fruition with a term that Paul Crutzen introduced called the Anthropocene indicating that this is a time when mankind is impacting many aspects of the Earth. And it's worth recognizing that man is already changing the Earth system. And uh, I have posed the question here, is it appropriate to consider introducing these kind of changes deliberately rather than carelessly? Uh, we're certainly changing the planet now. Uh, the question is whether we want to try and do some things to the planet uh, 
to maybe ameliorate some of the consequences of the, of the high CO2 levels. None of the people who are working on geoengineering think that it's time to geoengineer, that it's actually time to implement any of these techniques. But many people are, are thinking that it might be worthwhile thinking about how one might geoengineer. And that will be what I talk to you about for the rest of the lecture. This is a description of the topics for today. And in fact, I'm going to skip over some of the uh, top bullet uh, discussing fast and slow forcing and response. I'm going to frame this, kind of this conversation in the context of a bunch of people who are not climate scientists and not atmospheric scientists. So I'm not showing you many, no equations, not many um, uh, figures that require a detailed knowledge of, of the way the planet works. And it would take some time to discuss this fast and slow response, so I'm going to skip over it. The two techniques that I'm going to talk to you most about in, involve stratospheric aerosols. We know from, uh, and I'll show you in more detail, that uh, introduction of stratospheric aerosols can act to cool the planet, and the potential for seeding boundary layer clouds as well. And in both of these, using both of these strategies, I'll talk to you a bit about the climate response to these kind of changes and try to indicate to you how complicated it can be and, uh, and, and the importance of field experiments. And, and I'll close by just uh, mentioning some opportunities that uh, for scientists and uh, students and postdocs interested in doing this kind of work in the context of the research that's taking place here. So I'm going to begin by just reminding those of you that uh, haven't thought about it, what uh, or have thought about it, but not in many much detail. What is uh, driving the warming that we're uh, seeing, and in, in um, due to increases in greenhouse gases. This is a schematic diagram of the energy budget of the planet with a certain amount of energy coming in and being scattered either at the surface and reflected either at the surface or inside the atmosphere back to space. The energy which is absorbed in the atmosphere or at the surface then gradually will be re-emitted back to space. And it's re-emitted in a different part of the energy spectrum, primarily in the infrared part of the spectrum. Uh, some from the surface and some from the atmosphere itself. The energy which is emitted at the surface can be absorbed by, the, by uh, things in the atmosphere, gases and, uh, as well as aerosols and clouds. And uh, then the, the stuff which is absorbed in the atmosphere in the infrared can then be re-emitted back to the surface. And the presence and absence of the greenhouse gases is what's kind of modulating the the temperature of the planet, the surface temperature of the planet. The effective radiating temperature of the planet really is only in, uh, impacted by the, uh, the amount of energy that is, enters and leaves at the top. But the, the energy at the surface is, is controlled by the sort of interplay of radiative forcing that takes place between the atmosphere and the surface itself. And the surface temperature will go up if you increase the amount of greenhouse gas. So what the some of the geoengineering techniques have tried to do is, in order to compensate for the amount of energy which is being trapped or, or hindered from escaping by the greenhouse gases, if we can reduce slightly the amount of energy absorbed at the surface, that will also act to cool the planet. There have been a variety of techniques which have been suggested for doing this. And as I talked to you, mentioned to you already, we're going to focus on these two aerosols in the stratosphere and clouds seeding. Other geoengineering techniques have been to introduce giant reflectors into orbit to change the surface properties by, let's say, um, it, sometimes people have suggested putting reflective uh, material on uh, deserts or to genetically engineer crops to be a little bit whiter than they might otherwise be. Another set of techniques have to do with just um, explicitly drawing out CO2 much more rapidly from, uh, the, from the atmosphere than uh, we're currently doing to, to, to reduce CO2. And those class of techniques are called carbon dioxide removal. I'm going to skip over. I'm not going to talk to you about carbon dioxide removal techniques today, but I'm happy to chat with you about it over questions at the end if you want. 
So I just told you this, that there's two classes, these carbon dioxide or CDR techniques and solar radiation management techniques. Uh, what, when, when scientists, engineers, and others have, economists have tried to assess the, the costs and consequences of these sorts of geoengineering techniques, the conclusion is the CDR techniques are providing a long-term solution. It would take quite a while to implement them, and they're very expensive to implement. The solar radiation management techniques can occur very rapidly. They're relatively cheap. And, uh, and they work, well, they work quickly. And so um, people have, have begun to consider these, but of course they have consequences as well, and I'll talk to you more about them. There's one, method, one other method that has been um, proposed, which I won't speak to you much about today, but that would be for, to, to find ways to make some of the clouds, the high ice clouds, more transparent to outgoing long wave uh, energy as well. And I won't speak anymore. <coughs> so the, the next thing I'll do is just to remind you of the kind of meshes that we use in, in, in producing our projections of climate and climate change. Because it will have a con, uh, it, it will have a, be relevant to some of the things that I talked to you about, about how we assess the, con, the consequences of geoengineering as well. So we typically divide the planet. We, we put a mesh on top of the planet, dividing it up into a set of boxes. Each of those boxes is about 100 kilometers on a side, but sometimes a little bigger than that, sometimes a little smaller. And then divide the layers of the atmosphere. This is supposed to be a cross-section of the atmosphere from the surface in the gray to the top of the atmosphere into uh, layers. And near the surface, those layers are 100 meters or so in thickness, and at higher altitudes, they go to a kilometer or two thick. And I want you to just remember these numbers because some of the features that end up play, being important occur at very, very small scales. At the scale of clouds that you see out the window here that are a few tens of meters or hundreds of meters in size. And we have to do special things in order to treat those clouds in climate models. So then, now, to jump back into the first of the strategies that we talked, that I, I mentioned to you, these stratospheric aerosols, I'm showing you here a figure of Pinatubo a few days before the major eruption that occurred. It was already uh, pretty big there. And what, one, what we found is that after Pinatubo, which injected, um, well, a lot of, uh, of a gas called sulfur dioxide into the lower, uh, or to, to the upper atmosphere, at right around 20 kilometers in altitude, we see that oh, uh, this is a time series of surface temperature, and the black line is a set of observations of the average, the global average surface temperature, we see the planet cooled by about half a degree after Pinatubo. And we know from historical records that this happens for most major eruptions. So one idea has been that maybe instead of letting a volcanic eruption introduce this particular gas into the atmosphere and cool the planet, this gas make small particles, which I'll describe to you in a few minutes, that we would mimic that behavior uh, using a geoengineering strategy. So I've taken this cartoon from a very nice description of how stratospheric aerosols operate to describe to you some of the processes which control stratospheric aerosols. Uh, many Sulfur-containing gases are introduced at the surface. This is a cross-section of the atmosphere, with this axis being altitude, this being the equator, and this the North Pole or the South Pole. It doesn't matter. That the arrows here are indicating some of the fundamental circulation patterns that operate in the, uh, on the planet, not all of them. But uh, if you introduce a sulfur-containing gas near the surface, like a volcano, but there are many other sulfur-containing gases as well, then what they tend to have happen is they're mixed relatively rapidly um, in the lower part of the atmosphere. And they tend to get transported to the upper part of the atmosphere in the uh, equatorial regions. And when they're transported, they're gradually undergoing a bunch of chemical reactions to oxidize those sulfur species, um, gradually adding more and more oxygen atoms to the molecule until they the end product of that is usually sulfuric acid. 
a sulfuric, sulfuric acid gas. And this part of the atmosphere is very cold, and when the sulfuric acid gas reaches these altitudes, it can condense and make particles, small liquid particles. Those liquid particles can then coagulate and get bigger, and the, uh, more gas can condense on those particles as well. If they get big enough, they fall out, but they also tend to reside in this part of the atmosphere which is called the tropopause. Um, above this part of the atmosphere where it's very cold, the atmosphere actually warms up again, and these particles can evaporate and then get, um, undergo other photochemical reactions uh, to, and, and photolysis to uh, drive them back to another gas, back to sulfur dioxide. And so the, the sulfur molecules get uh, sort of suspended in throughout, the, throughout the atmosphere, but there's this layer of, of, sulfur, uh, of sulfuric acid particles that always exists in the atmosphere. And when volcanoes come around, more of those particles exist. So the idea is to introduce someplace in the atmosphere additional sulfur species, and then to have those additional sulfur species make more of these particles, like a volcano does, and for more of those particles to uh, cool the planet. Those particles, I haven't told you this, and I should have a long time ago, what they do is they scatter sunlight back to space. They act like little mirrors. So I'm now showing you a model result. This is one from a paper which I wrote in 2008 with Crutzen on this, uh, which shows a cross-section of the distribution of these sulfur species or the sulfur particles as a function of latitude, the equator here, the north and south pole at the edges. And the red areas here are indicating where the aerosols would exist. I'm showing this to you for June, July, and August just to show you that the particles, there are some asymmetries in, in them. And what you see now, the, the, the second panel here shows you, if you were to look down from space at the planet, and measure how much of the aerosol is contained in, in the column, these red areas are in indicating where there are lots of particles, and the brownish areas are where there are fewer particles. You see them tend to collect at the equator where the particles are being introduced into that, uh, in, into that region of the atmosphere, or the, the sources of sulfur species are being introduced into the stratosphere, and at the poles. And if you look at what the effect of those particles are in those regions, then this is showing you what's called the radiative forcing, the reduction in the amount of sunlight reaching the surface that is associated with the presence of those particles. So in this case, what you see is for June, July, and August that there's quite a reduction in the amount of sunlight reaching the surface at the North Pole, and there's still quite a bit of reduction of sunlight near the equator as well. So it's then interesting to act, ask, well, what would be the consequences of introducing these particles in the atmosphere? And I'm showing you that here. What I'm showing you is the difference between two simulations. One of the simulations in, in the left panel, and then the difference between two other simulations in the right panel. What we've done is to make one simulation we call, is, call a control, where we pretend that the planet has CO2 concentrations at, like in pre-industrial days. And in the case of the left panel, we've also made a simulation where we've doubled that amount of CO2. And then we've taken the difference between those two simulations. And, the diff and we, in this case, I'm showing you the difference in surface temperature. The red areas are showing you where the planet would warm up, and the white areas where there's not been much change. And what you see is that um, the planet tends to warm up more at the poles than it does at the equator, and that's something called the polar amplification effect and that the planet can warm up by as much as four degrees in the polar regions due to CO2 in this particular model. And in the right panel, what I'm showing you is the same kind of a simulation, but a simulation in which I've introduced the aerosols that I showed you on the previous slide. So what it, and in this case, I chose to introduce not enough of the aerosols to fully compensate for the warming, but it compensates for most of it. These increases in the white patches here are areas where there's not much change compared to the control model. So this is showing you that in, in the our climate model is suggesting that if I was to introduce these kind of aerosols into the climate model, it would cool the planet. 
But it has other effects as well. And I'm showing you, begin, uh, to begin with, some of the effects that we think uh, will occur, that, are, that have occurred on the planet when volcanic eruptions take place. And this is an interesting paper by Kevin Tranberth and Igor Dai that they published, where they showed, first off, the change in the amount of sunlight reaching the surface. And in this case, the gray area here, the Pinatubo erupted in late 91 or 92, I can't remember right now. But it, um, there was a reduction in the sunlight reaching the surface by order three or four watts per meter squared over the, this couple of year period. And what um, we see is if you look at the amount of river or discharge from rivers that occurred during that same time period, you can't see the axis, but this is again years, that there was a reduction in the amount of outflow from rivers that occurred at the same, at right, at the same time that this the sunlight was reduced. So this is a hint in observations that introduction of these particles into the lower stratosphere changes precipitation patterns on the planet. And if we do the same kind of thing in uh, a general circulation model, a climate model, we see, a simil we see similar features. What I've started to do here is to show you changes in precipitation distribution um, between our control run and a run in which we doubled CO2. The red areas here are sh showing you where precipitation increases and the blue areas where precipitation decreases. And what one sees is that if you were to average the whole planet up, you would see generally there's more precipitation in the um, in, a, in simulations where we've put uh, introduced extra CO2 than there would be in the control simulations. And the pattern of precipitation has changed. With more of the precipitation occurring, in, as indicated by red here, over the Pacific, and less of it occurring just on the flanks of this uh, increase in precipitation. And there are also other differences, like reductions in precipitation over southeast China, for example. And these, some of these signatures are signatures that we have seen in, uh, already in the, um, in the climate record. If we compare precipitation over southeast China, for example, uh, it's been decreasing compared to historical runs. So it's this kind of, a, of, si of, of signatures which um, the models are predicting and which we've seen in, on the planet already. Uh, the hatched regions, these little horizontal lines, are indicating where the model believes that the changes are statistically significant. If we then, instead of doing a simulation with just doubled CO2, we introduce these stratospheric aerosols at the same time, then what you see are fewer areas where it's colored. And the areas where the, it's white are indicating areas where the model says that there will be very little precipitation change. So in this case, the hint is that geoengineering would return the planet to a, many parts of the planet to an area that looks more like present day than if we don't do the geoengineering. But there are still regions where there are changes. And so it's, it's not suggesting that one would get to a planet that looks exactly like today. Now, another modeling group redid the same kind of a calculation. And when they do their calculation for just doubling of CO2, they see a pattern which looks much like this. But when they doubled CO2 and introduced geoengineering into their model, they got a different pattern from, the, from our model. And, and the message here then is we can't have a lot, or we don't currently have a lot of faith in our model's ability to predict exactly what the precipitation changes would be. There are other consequences to the temperature field and winds and sea ice and the chemistry of the atmosphere. And I, I won't have, well, I'll talk to you briefly about some of those now. I'm going to now have taken a side here and tell you a little bit about how complicated it can be to predict what kind of particles form in the atmosphere and, and how they might form if we were to introduce geoengineering aerosols. So what I'm going to show you here 
are plots of what's called the size distribution of aerosols in the atmosphere, just a schematic diagram with lines on here. And those lines are supposed to say, at this particular size, a certain number of aerosols existed, and at this particular size, bigger aerosols on this end and little aerosols on this end, there were a certain number of aerosols as well. And what we see is that if there are no volcanic eruptions around, that a typical size distribution might look like this, with most of the aerosols being peaked at a number which is above the F here in this case. What we find is if we go out and measure aerosols after a volcanic eruption, we see more aer oopsie daisy, we see more aerosols. So the red line, the volcanic size distribution, is always above the blue line. And we see that peak is kind of shifted to bigger aerosols as well. And there's a lot more big aerosols and a few more small aerosols. Another thing I want to point out to you is that from fundamental physics, we know that smaller aerosols are brighter. They scatter energy back to space more efficiently than large aerosols do. And we also know that large aerosols will just tend to fall out of the atmosphere more rapidly as well. So um, it's really the small aerosols down here which are responsible for cooling the planet, but there's a lot more big aerosols also. And we also know that for if you had a given amount, let's say you had one aerosol drop, and uh, one big aerosol drop, and you took it and you split it into two, two aerosol drops, the surface to volume ratio of the two smaller aerosol drops is higher. And there's more surface area on small drops than there are on large drops for a given mass of aerosol. And the reactions which produce ozone loss are a function of the surface area. So if you have small drops, they produce more ozone loss than large drops. And I'll talk to you more about that in a minute also. Now, if we introduce geoengineering aerosols, and we introduce them by just putting more sulfur dioxide into the planet, then this is the kind of a size distribution that our models are suggesting now that we would see. And so we'd, we wouldn't get a size distribution which looks quite like volcanic eruptions. And the reason is because during a volcanic eruption, you start with a, uh, an atmosphere where there are very few aerosols, and you make, when you introduce this gas, you make lots of new aerosols. But when you if you were to do it with respect to geoengineering, the plan would be to constantly be introducing these aerosols and to always have more aeros or aerosols sitting around in this region of the atmosphere called the tropopause. And if we continue to introduce these SO2, this SO2 gas into the atmosphere and there are existing particles, then most of the existing, most of the gas that once it's converted to sulfuric acid gas, most of it's going to condense on existing particles rather than make new particles. And so the existing particles just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and falling out of the atmosphere rather than making a bunch of new particles. So instead of that, what people are now suggesting is that you might introduce the aerosol source, the geoengineering source of aerosols in as sulfuric acid immediately as small droplets. Those small droplets won't co coagulate very quickly, and they will result in more aerosols at, that is indicated by the black line here, more small aerosols than you would if you introduced SO2 gas. So the current thinking is that this is suggesting that certain strategies will not work very well for introducing stratospheric aerosols and other strategies might work better. And this study, which appeared last year, is showing you the kind of, um, the kind of outcomes that might, one might get for different, uh, introducing different amounts of sulfur into the atmosphere. Um, this is measuring the amount of, of sulfur that would, as, would exist as a geoengineering aerosol. And what you see is that um, for various ways of introducing the sulfur-containing species, you get a different burden of aerosol for a, different, for, for a given amount of I injection. And some mechanisms are much more efficient at 
producing aerosols that can survive for a while than others. And because some, in some strategies are more effective than others, they tend to scatter energy back to space more effectively than others also. So the message here is the strategy that you use, you use for introducing the sulfur into the atmosphere matters. There are other consequences in addition to cooling the planet and changing precipitation distribution. Then it also changes ozone. And what I'm showing you here are uh, changes to, that are due to the introduction of the aerosols. You, uh, of these geoengineering aerosols. One actually sees more ozone at certain altitudes and less ozone at other altitudes. And if you sum all of the ozone up in the column from the top of the atmosphere to the surface, then what you find is that in the net there is going to be less ozone at high latitudes and more ozone in the uh, tropics if you introduce the geoengineering aerosol into the planet. So here I've tried to summarize some of the things which um, our modeling studies have produced. Uh, and I think I've said most of these things already. One of the, me the uh, things that I have not talked about is that one of the reasons that we are worried particularly about the ozone hole, for example, on the planet was because it allows more ultraviolet radiation to reach the surface. And that has important consequences for skin cancer for us, but also for the productivity and, and viability of plants as well. There are many, and, and other animal organisms. So there are many reasons to be worried about how much ultraviolet energy reaches the surface. But interestingly enough, there are a couple of studies that suggest that the increase in ultraviolet that might result from ozone depletion due to geoengineering aerosols could be balanced to some degree because Introducing these aerosols into the atmosphere also attenuates ultraviolet energy. And at the moment, we don't know which would win out. Would we get less ultraviolet reaching the surface because of the aerosol or, uh, or more because of the ozone depletion? We don't know the answer. The other thing is that we know that introducing these kind of aerosols, in, a, in addition to producing beautiful red sunrises and sunsets, it results in more uh, a change in the amount of diffuse sunlight that reaches the surface. The sky looks whiter, and shadows are less bright than they would otherwise be. And so this change in direct and diffuse energy reaching the surface has an impact on photosynthesis. It can change the amount of uh, sunlight that reaches plants. It ends up that more sunlight can enter the plant canopy from diffuse sunlight than it can from direct sunlight. So that increases. Um, photosynthetic energy uh, available for ecosystems, but it can also reduce the amount of sunlight that uh, is available for solar energy. Because current, most current technologies you'd use what are called concentrators to, to drive um, the, the solar energy production, and it requires direct sunlight to do that. Then another thing to mention to you that is that what geoengineering does is to cool the planet, but what it doesn't do is to change the amount of CO2 that's in, in the, on the Earth. Or, and it ends up that some of the CO2, which is introduced into the atmosphere, as you might already know, gets absorbed by seawater. And once it's absorbed by seawater, it reacts to form carbonic acid, and it changes the pH of the ocean and has an effect on uh, ocean life also, and the ability to make shells, for example, of many species. So there are some, some things that SRM, solar radiation management, can deal with, and other consequences that geoengineering can't deal with. OK, now I'm going to jump here. And how am I doing on time? OK, I'm going to have to go faster through the other strategy. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, another geoengineering strategy of changing clouds to make more clouds or make clouds whiter than they might otherwise be. We already know humans affect clouds. This example figure is this is a satellite image off the coast of, I think this is the Bay of Biscay here. And no, this one is off the coast of California. 
What you see are a bunch of white streaks that are occurring, um, superimposed on some sort of classic cloud patterns that we would see on the planet. We end up knowing what produces these white streaks. These are called ship tracks, and they occur when ships sail along the surface of the ocean, and they introduce small particles, pollution, into the boundary layer. And those small particles act as sites where cloud drops like to form. Cloud drops don't form uh, spontaneously in, in the atmosphere on their own. They tend to, what happens is that you get water vapor molecules depositing on particle surfaces, called cloud condensation nuclei, and those form the cloud drops. So when the ships introduce pollution, they produce areas where, in the atmosphere, where cloud, you can get more cloud drops. And we know from simple physical theory that more aerosols will make more cloud dr drops. Those cloud drops are competing for the same amount of water vapor as would be there if the pollution wasn't around. And so the drops which exist tend to be smaller than they would if there, were, if there was no pollution. And we know smaller cloud drops are more reflective. And we also know that clouds that contain smaller drops, ten, uh, well, our theories suggest that those clouds will last longer. This is called the cloud lifetime effect. And they might have a, a more larger spatial extent as well. And an interesting early study by Tony Slingo in 1990 um, showed that clouds are really a very important way of um, uh, they, they're an important player in the energy budget of the planet, and that rather modest changes in cloud properties could easily balance a doubling of CO2. Um, these are an indication of, a, of the, the size of the kind of changes to the clouds that might be needed in order to double, to balance the warmings that occur from a doubling of CO2. And if you were to combine some of these effects, let's say you increase the number of drops in a cloud you, and simultaneously decrease the cloud drop size and maybe make clouds a little bit more per pervasive than they otherwise are, you, you would require much smaller changes than this to, in order to balance the warming associated with CO2. So these kind of ideas stimulated a suggestion by John Latham in uh, the in the 1990 or so, that one could perhaps introduce more clouds into the, uh, or more particles into near the surface of the planet and make the clouds brighter and that that would act to, uh, to cool the planet. So in a study that we published in 2008, we tried to identify what clouds might be most susceptible to this brightening effect. And the red regions here are indicating areas where you would, you would get the most bang for your buck, if you will. And I'm not going to take much time to tell you about this slide. But the point is, in, in, in areas which support what are called marine stratocumulus clouds, that's the area where you get the most bang for your buck. So what's been suggested is that one might sail a bunch of ships around, introducing particles in, near the surface. and um, the, these ships would be introducing them in areas where marine stratocumulus exists. Now, I've jumped back here to a ship that existed in 1939. This is a sailing ship. And these <coughs> vertical cylinders here are spinning. And these are actually, actually sails. This is a technology which never was picked up on. Such a technology exists, existed then and exists today, but nobody is using it. These were being suggested as uh, the major mechanism for um, building freighters in the 30s and 40s. And at just about that time, uh, instead of that, they went from sailing ships to uh, fossil fuel burning for, for the primary mechanism for, for freighters. And so this never took off. But what has been suggested is this space age version of the same ship, which in this case, is dragging. This is a trimaran that is using a modified version of these sails with these flanges, um, are much more efficient versions of those cylinders. 
It's dragging a turbine behind it, sucking seawater in, converting that seawater to very small particles, blasting the seawater as small particles into the near surface air, and having those particles then evaporate and spread through the boundary layer, and then be available as uh, these particles to brighten the clouds. So this is an alternate to the to, to the pollution particles that we saw in those ship tracks, but another mechanism for brightening clouds. So there's a number of science questions that be, can, can be considered, and I, I'm going to have to skip through this really quickly to finish up, I think. We can look at what would be the consequences of changing the reflectivity of clouds if we were to explore them in a uh, general circulation in a climate model, like the climate model I showed you for ozone, uh, or for the uh, stratospheric aerosols, but I won't I think I better skip over that. But then also I ask, is it possible to increase the reflectivity of clouds deliberately? And how would we do it? What would we do it? Where would we do it? That kind of thing. And I think I'll show you that instead. I'll skip these. And come back to a slide. In this case, what I'm doing is to, there was supposed to be a cool animation, which I can't show you right now, which I'm showing you here on the red hatched lines the size of the grid boxes of climate models, and then superimposed on a satellite image of clouds, and then a blow up of that satellite image. Uh, the, the red square here is, corresponds to this square. And then what this animation would have done would be to zoom in on one of these clouds and to show you all the very fine scale features of those clouds. It ends up, in order to you know, properly resolve even the updrafts and downdrafts of those clouds, you need to have boxes that are a few tens to hundreds of meters in size. Not 100 kilometers or 300 kilometers like this, but essentially a thousand times smaller on a side, 100 meters on a side. So there's a million, if we were to divide each of these boxes into a million cells, then we would have a model which could simulate a cloud more accurately. And what I'm going to show you now is a few uh, pictures of what would happen if we introduced particles into a model which can resolve these kind of clouds. And I'm going to show you panels where, what I'm uh, in a minute here, where we've looked at the evolution of clouds. This is supposed to be a picture of an area of the planet looking down from the top. This is the east-west direction, let's say, in the north-south direction. And then the white areas are supposed to indicate clouds. And I'm showing you a snapshot of that area at six hours, and then how the cloud model resolves those clouds at 12 hours and then at 18 hours. And so you see, in this case, what's happening is that for this particular set of initial conditions and for the amount of aerosols that we have and we've introduced into this model atmosphere, the, the clouds tend to decrease and organize themselves, changing from what are called um, closed cellular convection to open cellular convection in this case. And now I'm going to show you what happens when we sail some of these imaginary devices through our cloud model atmosphere and um, spraying additional aerosols into it and how the clouds evolve when you do that. I'm showing you on the left panels here the evolution when we introduce the three ships into the, into the model sailing from left to right here. And in the right set of panels, if we took the sea salt from those three ships and instead of introducing it as point sources at the head of each of these little uh, plumes, instead of that, if we just spread it out over the whole atmosphere all at once, this is what the, how the planet would evolve. So this is what we call uniform injection, and then this is a three point source injection. And what we've done is to start the, the model off from a situation which looks like clouds when in a pristine environment, when there's not a lot of pollution around, and what happens when we introduce uh, the clouds when there are more aerosol particles, when it's a little bit more polluted. And what you can see is that the response of the injection of these aerosols changes depending upon how much other kind of aerosols there are around as well, and that's the message. So we've scoped out in a study which just appeared this month, just a few weeks ago, um, 
what the response would be of injecting these kind of aerosols, sea salt aerosols, into stratocumulus clouds in a variety of different circumstances. When the boundary layer is moist, when it's dry, when it's polluted, when it's unpolluted, etc., to try and identify, well, what are the consequences to the planet from this, uh, this kind of a seeding strategy? There, and there, it ends up that certain environments are, more, uh, are better than others for this, and I won't tell you any more about that. I think I better skip over this. I'm going to close. Well, this is a good message to leave you with, I guess. Geoengineering is complicated. And in addition to all the science -y kind of things that I've talked to you about, there are all kinds of issues of governance and ethics and morals. What I've shown you is the planet doesn't change uniformly. It'll rain more in one place, less in others. So there will be winners and losers. How do we decide on who's the winners, who's the losers, etc.? There are various risks associated with it and various costs associated with these differences in strategies. And I'm going to just show you here one interesting thing. This is a, a simulation that was done by Alan Robach and his colleagues, where what they did was to simulate the increase in temperature that's taking place from CO2, or from pre-industrial to present day times, and then introduce a bunch of different kind of, or different amounts of geoengineering aerosol at just at in the year 2008 and then run it for 10 or 20 years and then turn it back off again. And what you see is depending on how much they introduced, the, how much aerosol they introduced, they could reach different amounts of cooling and as soon as they turned it off the planet warmed right back up again. Now it ends up we're all we're really worried about this kind of a temperature increase, but if we were ever to encounter this kind of a temperature increase, it would be much worse for the planet because this wouldn't be enough time for many, many, many kinds of uh, plant and animal life to adapt. So if we were to introduce geoengineering and then all of a sudden decide to turn it off, it would be a really bad thing. You wouldn't want to start this kind of geoengineering without figuring out how to draw CO2 down so that you could turn it off again. You wouldn't want to start it if you, if you couldn't find an ALK strategy for it also. I'm going to skip this and estimates of the cost, and then jump into my closing remarks so there's time for a few questions. I, Jim has told me that we can run over on the questions as long as we want, but I won't make you stay past the hour for sure. The, um, the conclusions that we've come to so far is eliminating anthropogenic emissions of CO2 is obviously the best situation, the best way to do this. But if we're not doing anything else, then it may be that solar radiation is uh, something we should, management is something we should consider. It's unlikely to provide a long-term solution. We can't just keep introducing more and more and more aerosols to balance more and more and more CO2. We have to find a way to get past it. And it but it might be useful as an attractive interim solution to prevent some kinds of things like, let's say, the irreversible melting of the ice caps in, over in Greenland and Antarctica. Uh, and while we're finding a mechanism for getting rid of the CO2 and converting our energy infrastructure. I've barely, we've barely scratched the surface on this kind of research. There's lots of other things that can be done having to do with the different aerosol species. We haven't looked very much at the chemistry and aerosol physics, um, at ocean and sea ice impacts, at the biogeochemical response of the planet. There are in the words of Donald Rumsfeld, obviously unknown unknowns, and uh, there are things that we don't, we haven't anticipated yet that we certainly need to think about. Um, we've only, only a few of us have been doing this to now. There's lots more opportunities. The research area is new and very controversial. It's relevant to fundamental science. I had to skip over the reasons why it might be relevant to fundamental science, but feel free to ask me in the questions period if you want. There's only a few grants around that are supporting this kind of work today. There is a lot more support for this kind of research in Europe right now than there is in the US. Uh, the group here at PSU is, uh, they have things to offer and people who are potentially interested in this. So. Uh, I've tried to acknowledge some of the activities that we thought might be of interest to you guys here. There are many other opportunities related to geoengineering within a university like PSU that's not just science and engineering. 
Um, there are also economic uh, issues associated with it. Uh, one needs to assess this kind of a strategy in the context of other sorts of strategies for dealing with climate change and to do risk assessments um, in order to talk somebody into actually being able to do that or willing to do this kind of thing. It it's, uh, may require treaties, negotiations across countries, um, all sorts of things associated with political science and environmental policy. There's lots of engineering aspects to be done. There are the obvious ethical re issues that need to be visit revisited, like there will be winners and losers, and how do we deal with that? And uh, there are also conversations need to occur about, well, do we really want to consider doing this kind of thing? And how do we hold a conversation with, with the rest of society about it as well that enter in in the context of sort of sociological issues also? And I think I'll stop here and take questions if there are any. Yeah. So what is the typical lifetime of uh, aerosols that you introduce? The, the lifetime of aerosols in the stratosphere yeah. is sort of a year, one year. It's an e-folding time of a year. And the, in, in the near the surface, it's more like, well, if it gets into a cloud, it's a few minutes. If it doesn't get into a cloud, it's a week or two at the longest. And so an average for the planet might be four or five days. And um, just one more question. When you did the modeling, where did you inject it? From the surface or from some certain level of the model? In the, in the stratospheric aerosol case, we introduced it. There have been a variety of things explored. The simulations that I showed you were introducing it at 25 kilometers at the equator. Well, I mean, I think we think that there, our estimates are probably only accurate to an order of magnitude. So there, there, there is no difference at this point in the game. One of the things I mentioned to you that um, the, at the beginning that these geoengineering activities are estimated to be quite cheap. People think that you could do this for a few billion dollars a year to maybe a few tens of billion dollars a year, which is less, less than, for example, the amount of money that we're spending on the defense budget today in the United States. It's the kind of, and, and some of the estimates are that it would be an order of magnitude less than that. So it's the kind of the thing that a rich uh, entrepreneur could, or a, or a single country could afford to do by themselves. Makes it pretty worrisome, actually. And, the relative cost of the boundary layer cloud seeding or the stratospheric aerosols is about the same. And it's cheap compared to anything that you could do with respect to, to um, CO2 sequestration, for example. But of course, that's just the first order cost. There are all kinds of sort of secondary consequences that I that we haven't looked at, that have not yet been looked at in, with respect to these geoengineering activities. And it must certainly be a very simple and naive estimate of, the, of those costs. So I wouldn't advertise them as being accurate today. Yeah? Has there been very much modeling um, performed on maybe increased um, acid rain in forests? Yeah, we've looked into that. And it ends up that only it, because the aerosols last so long up that high, you don't have to introduce very much, very many of them compared to the amount of either natural aerosols that exist near the surface or the amount that we introduce as pollution. So for example, we think that with one, two, or three million tons a year of aerosols introduced at that altitude, it would compensate doubling of CO2. And we think today that we're introducing somewhere between 60 and 80 million tons a year of pollution today. Um, and that doesn't count the natural aerosols that are already occurring. So when you sum up the anthropogenic and natural aerosols, this is a few percent at most, and maybe less than that, of what we're currently introducing into the atmosphere in terms of of um, acid rain. So if you, it would be effortless 
to decrease the amount of pollution that we're putting into the planet now in order to, produce, to introduce a little extra pollution at high altitudes and, and cool the planet. Now, and, and, and that would balance this acid rain effect, if you will. So I, the, the estimates of the model right now are that this would not have a consequence in that way. There are consequences, obviously, but not in terms of acid rain. Yeah? How would um, the, the sulfuric acid be delivered to the tropopause? Well, one of the, I mean, there, there are a variety of mechanisms that have been performed or, or, or have been speculated upon, but um, one of the mechanisms would be to carry, uh, people are not suggesting that you introduce, or you, you produce a whole bunch of sulfuric acid at the surface and then and then lift it in a plane or fire it in a rocket to altitude. I think what they're suggesting that one might do would be to carry uh, sul elemental sulfur to the, to, to the street. And there's tons and tons of elemental sulfur sitting in piles uh, around the planet today. To carry it as elemental sulfur to the lower stratosphere, oxidize it there to sulfuric acid and release the sulfuric acid there. And I can refer you to some papers on it if you're interested more. Yeah, and the way back. What you just outlined there, how much would that affect global sulfur cycles? And how much do your models account for it coupling with other uh, geochemical cycles? Well, it's very, as I said, this is a perturbation that is no more than a, a, a few percent of, of, well, let's see, OK. I mean, these are, our numbers are, won't be super accurate, but I suspect that there's 60 or 70 teragrams of sulfur being introduced into the planet through anthropogenic sources right now per year. And there's another 30 to 70 that are, in, that are natural sources of sulfur. So let's say it was 150 teragrams, a uh, million tons. And, um, we're suggesting one to five teragrams uh, of sulfur th that would be required to, for the stratospheric aerosols. But do your models account for coupling with other geochemical cycles, or are they just looking at the aerosols in isolation? Um, they're, they're just looking at the aerosols in isolation. I mean, we're certainly interested in those things. But again, it's introducing a few percent perturbation on the existing biogeochemical cycles. Yeah. Two closely related questions. Uh, roughly how many people are working professionally in geoengineering in the U.S. today? And, and is the U.S. the overall leader in the field? Uh, there is uh, maybe a dozen in the U.S. And that includes postdocs and students, PhD students. And there's probably five people at our level, faculty or uh, lab scientists who are thinking about it in the U.S. And, um, and then another couple of dozen in the rest of the world. What was this? Did I get it all, or was there another part another that part I missed? Are there any, is the U.S. leading the other? Oh, the U.S. are, are certainly, we're, we're very important players. In fact, right now, we're probably still, well, it's certainly an international effort, uh, but the U.S. is, I, well, so in the last five years, I've probably written less than a dozen papers on it, and I, that's probably half the literature in the last five years in, in the U.S., maybe, or maybe a quarter of the literature. And, and, then, and then there's the same amount that's doing, working in, in the rest of the world. Mostly in Europe, there's not much coming out of Asia. Yeah, Kel. Um, you mentioned that there was an importance for this basic science research. And I'm curious if you want to talk about that for a second. Well, I've kind of highlighted it. I mean, some of the, well, there are all kinds of things. Oh, yeah, sure. You're prompting me now. I get to go back and look at the, let's see. So, uh, well, one of them, there's many fundamental science things. But this one is one I want to talk to you about. Uh, you. How many of you have seen this figure before? Uh, less than half. OK, so this is from a very, very well-known document on climate change called the uh, 
IPCC, or Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, fourth assessment document. And what it's attempting to do is to identify the agents in the atmosphere which are responsible, potentially responsible for climate change. And what they've done is to partition it into greenhouse gases and CO2, and then all the other things, ozone. It ends up, you know, through uh, various uh, biogeochemical cycles, we can also influence methane. And then there's aerosols. And then there's things like variations in sunspots and solar forcing and all of that kind of stuff. The red areas are supposed to indicate agents which are responsible for warming the planet, and the blue, the ones that are responsible for cooling the planet. And these black bars that you see here are indicating what are, um, what is the uncertainty of these estimates. And you'll notice the bars on these gases, well, at least the upper ones, are relatively small. So that's indicating that CO2 is a really important forcing agent, and we are relatively confident of what our estimates are of, those, of, their, of its importance. But if you come down here and you look at the things having to do with aerosols, you'll see that they could be really important, but we're really uncertain about how, uh, about how important they are. So there, it ends up aerosols influence the planet in a couple of ways. The aerosols themselves scatter sunlight back to space, and that's called the direct effect. And they change the clouds. And then the clouds scatter sunlight back to space, and that's this cloud albedo effect. So we're less certain about how aerosols and clouds interact than we are about almost anything else on this chart. And it ends up aerosol-cloud interactions are so both critical and poorly understood. And at the moment, the only thing that we can do is to look at what's going on in the planet right now and, and then try to simulate what we see. But not ever, we don't do what you would do in a classic science uh, environment where you introduce a hypothesis and then you design an experiment to test that hypothesis and you see how well your hypothesis explains what's going on. So, one thing that we've thought about is maybe we could introduce science experiments which would check our understanding of aerosol cloud interactions. And um, I'm going to tell you about one of those in just a second. But this is a critical issue as well, that what we know is because we've been introducing so many aerosols into the planet over the last hundred years, they could have a really big effect on what, how the planet has been responding over the last hundred years. And we don't know how much that effect they've had. So it's not only, uh, well, in addition to thinking that CO2 has changed the planet, aerosols might have changed the planet. And we, since we can't understand how aerosols have changed the planet, it's hindering our ability to explain how CO2 might change the planet also. So it's, it's hindered our ability to explain how the planet has changed over the last couple hundred years. And that confounds our ability to predict future climate change. Because we use our ability to predict or to, to simulate what's happened in the past to predict what's going to happen in the future. So if we were to design a field experiment to understand aerosols and clouds interactions, it would contribute to fundamental understanding of the climate system also. And so I, with a few other people, have suggested that we might uh, try to produce a field experiment to, do, to explicitly check our understanding of aerosols and clouds for particular aerosol types. And marine stratocumulus is one that we've chosen. It's really important for um, the climate system, and it's also important for geoengineering. So uh, we have a white paper on this. We have not actually proposed to any funding agencies to do this experiment, but it's in discussion at this point in the game. And there are lots of these kind of experiments that one can 